I'm going to start off by asking two questions, okay? How many of you all in this room have had major issues with doing tonsillectomy, especially when it comes to bleeding? Put up your hands. Well, the rest of you all who have not put up their hands either are fantastic surgeons or you all are not doing enough tonsils. Thank you, guys. That means most of them, most of you are with me. And you know that when you have that torrential bleed from that tonsillar fossa, it just takes away a few years of your life, doesn't it? Now, the other thing is I also tell my residents that if at all there are two surgeries that you have to have the highest respect for in ENT, it's probably the two most commonest surgeries, which is tonsillectomy and, tonsil uh, and tracheostomy. It's done so routinely that when it comes to bite you, it bites you really, really bad. So we all have a healthy respect for this surgery. Why? Because as what Baha said, when problems arise, it can really be bad. So over the years, especially in the last decade, we have started to look at what are more safer and, and sort of endpoint outcomes in terms of doing this surgery. So let's look at a little bit of history. When did this whole concept of partially removing the tonsils or you know, tonsillotomy actually started? Actually, this was what was done historically. The whole concept of extracapsular tonsillectomy was only, has only come about in the 20th century, in the early 20th century, and it only became popularized after the advent of anesthesia and intubation. Before that, we were doing less, and it didn't seem that we actually got any, any different results. So historically, we've been doing it, and we've been getting away with it. But then, as surgeons, our mindset is always we want to do something complete, we want to take it out completely. So that was number one. Number two, the procedure itself. What is tonsillotomy actually? Now, if you look at tonsillotomy, the description today in today's literature, there are actually two classes. One is class one, which is described as tonsillotomy. And what is class two? Class two is a partial tonsillectomy or a, a, a subcapsular or intracapsular tonsillectomy. All right? Now, what is the difference between the two? There are very clear definitions between the two. A tonsillotomy basically is removing tissue medial to the fossil pillars. That means you're only taking out the projecting, projecting part of the tonsils, leaving whatever tonsillar tissue that is lateral to the anterior and the posterior pillars. A, a, a intracapsular tonsillectomy or a subtotal tonsillectomy means you remove the entire tonsil, the mass of the tonsils, leaving behind a rim of tonsillar tissue above the capsule. What is the benefit of doing this? The benefit of doing this is it has been shown, okay, uh, very significantly that it reduces the risk of post-operative hemorrhage. Number two, it reduces post-op pain. Number three, it reduces the analgesic use. And number four, early, earlier uh, eating, okay? Now, isn't that all the benefits that we want from doing a surgery? Then we have to look at what are the indications for doing tonsillectomy. Uh, uh, or rather removal of the tonsils. I've got no issues of doing a tonsillectomy when it comes to tumour or anything like that. But today's indication for tonsillectomy or tonsillotomy is basically obstructive sleep apnea. I think that has become the primary reason why I do tonsils today. So, why do we need to take out the whole tonsils? It doesn't make sense. All you're trying to do is you're trying to create space. And it's only one part of the airway and you can get much more safer outcomes, better outcomes. So these are things that we have to really understand why. But in the last, especially in the last three years, there have been more and more evidence has come out, especially systematic, uh, systemic reviews that have actually shown that they have expanded the indications, including for recurrent tonsillitis, and they have shown even the same findings that over, ten, uh, over the two years or three years follow-ups that these patients have had, they don't have many issues in terms of uh, recurrent tonsillitis, regrowth. The, 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 the numbers are very, very, very small. Okay? So all these things are worry about regrowth and all that. Yes, when we take consent for these patients, we must tell them this. But I think that's, that's the main direction that we need to look at when we are sort of going for uh, less. Uh, in, in fact, what I'm trying to say is doing less is actually more in these cases. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what is the next things. The advantages, we've already talked about. The disadvantages, I think it's only the primary thing that we need to talk about is regrowth. Now, whatever said and done, there, there are juniors in this room, I'll tell you, learn the anatomy. 
because primarily you must know the anatomy. We have seen horrors of how our residents sometimes dissect and you're like, you know, hey, don't butcher that. It's a very delicate surgery. And I know a lot of you all are very comfortable using headlights for tonsillectomy or even tonsillotomy. Today, I will not operate a tonsil without a microscope or an endoscope. It makes a world of a difference because you're really identifying the capsule and you're really doing very, very nice dissection. And when you do that, you know, when we first started using coblation, there was a whole lot of issues about post-op bleeding with coblation and everybody threw it away. See, always remember, you know, we are, we are creatures of habit. Whenever there's a new tool that comes along, we all jump onto it, but we fail to realize that there's a learning curve. How many of you all think that there's a learning curve in doing tonsillectomy? Put up your hands. And it is the most, the first surgery that we give our residents to do without guiding them. Why is there a learning curve? It is because you don't dissect it properly, you're going to get into trouble. I can, I can tell you that even if you do a cold method, complete tonsillectomy, you can do it with very minimal post-op pain if you do a proper dissection. Then you have all these tools that Baha showed earlier, the laser, the coblation, the uh, harmonic scalpel. You have even bigger learning curves with this tool. Now, I've become a huge proponent of coblation. I, I've been through the whole cycle. I, was a, I always believed that the cold, steel improved, the cold steel technique is still the best technique. But then when you start learning, you, know, you start getting into this other instruments, and then you find the benefits of it. I think coblation is probably one of the things that has really changed the game for tonsils. They talk about microdebrider, intracapsular tonsillectomy. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about doing it because, yeah, it seems very good and very nice. But that thing of where you have that coagulation and the coagulation, especially where you can actually coagulate and control, you can really, you know, you can really shave down the tonsils very nicely, tonsillar tissue, and you can just bring it to, it's so controlled that you get very, very good results. So I think it's, it's perceptions. It's, we are all creatures of habit. That's why we don't want to change. But if you really go down this path and explore it, I think you will realize that it gives you a lot of benefit. Now, I really was very uncomfortable doing this debate for one very particular reason. I used to do about 60 to 70 tonsils in the year, okay? In the last, from beginning of 2018 till now, I've only done three tonsils. Any guesses why? We have not asked, these are my opinions. What is tonsils? It's lymphoid tissue, right? Why does the lymphoid tissue need to grow? Has anybody asked this question before? Why does the lymphoid, why is it? And it's sitting in the Waldeus ring. It is only supposed to grow up to the age of seven, eight, and then it's supposed to regress by 12. In fact, it's the opposite. Why are you worried about regrowth when in actual fact, these tissues are actually supposed to regress after the age of eight, and it's supposed to really be non-functional by the age of 12? Anybody thought about this? So what causes that lymphoid hyperplasia? Atopy? Something must be, it's an immune system. So something immune is driving this process, correct? So if you don't treat that immune system, that tissue is going to regrow. And the primary thing that when you look at tonsils, what's actually happening is we are actually having all these patients with tonsils, if you go and ask a history of mouth breathing, they've actually got their mouth open when they're sleeping. Okay? So the take-home message, working with dentists has been fantastic because when now in the dental circles, when we actually talk to patients, these doctors who are actually dealing with breathing issues, evidence has shown that by getting them to start breathing correctly and getting them to close the mouth has brought about two great reductions in tonsils. That means if you have a grade four, they can bring it down to grade two. From grade three, they can bring it down to grade one. Isn't that amazing? And that's what I'm beginning to see in my practice. So again, think about it. You take out the adenoids, you do a complete adenoidectomy, you do a complete tonsillectomy. What are the lymphoid tissues there? There's one sitting right there in the base of your tongue. So if you don't treat the underlying inflammatory process, what's going to happen is you're going to get lingual hypertrophy, which is an even bigger problem to treat in adults because a lot of our OSA patients, when you put that scope in there, with the history of adenotonsillectomy, you will see a huge lingual tonsil there. All these are things that we are now beginning to look into. So evidence is moving in a different direction. So that would be my take-home message. Please 
think about it a different way because we are, we are so used to it. Like I said, we are creatures of habit and change never comes easy for us, especially surgeons. So think about it, go back, maybe Baha. We've been looking at it maybe from a different perspective, so it's time for a relook. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jivinen. So he shared with us his experiences and at the end threw a spanner in the works by asking us to think does it need to be done in the first place? So let's put up the um, Slido um, vote because people can start voting now. Yes, uh, Dr. Catalano. Very good back and forth uh, on pros and cons and issues to think about. Uh, JJ, you bring up a lot of good points. Just want to make a couple of comments. In adults, big tonsils, 18, 19, 20, 30, 40 year old people uh, is not due to uh, inhalant allergy in those people. Uh, they have one, usually one problem in their tonsil unless they have lymphoma or cancer, which is rare, and they have actinomyces. And you cannot cure actinomyces. It's a bacteria that is in the tonsil in adults, and the only way you get rid of it is by taking the tonsil out. And if you cut that tonsil up, you'll find actinomyces 100% of the time. So that's not responsive to an allergy program. In a child, it can, but I've never seen lingual tonsil hypertrophy in a child as a result of uh, you know, yeah, taking You don't see them in care. children, you see them way older in adults. That's my point. So it doesn't really matter because you're not gonna see lingual tonsil hypertrophy because the reason why the adenoids are big in adults is not the same mechanism. It's actinomyces or cancer or lymphoma. Totally different biology. In children, I have left marginal tonsils in. Oral surgeon, I mean, a dentist sends us a child, tonsils are on the fence. They're around a three, two and a half, three. They're not a four, they're not a one. And we've watched them, we've not taken them out. And I've had to go back in and take those tonsils out, even though we've done the nose and adenoids and everything else, uh, more often than I'd like. So I find that taking the tonsil out when it's marginal is always better. Now, the reason why you mentioned not taking the tonsil out is very good, it's pain and return to work and all those kinds of things. But I don't know, do you guys have something here called ENT seps or microline forceps for tonsils? Yeah. That's a game changer. So this is a tissue welding forcep. It's heat controlled. So when you use it, you do not scar, you do not cauterize, you do not burn the, the pharyngeal constrictor muscle. When you take the tonsil out, the bed is pink, much better even than the coblator. And so with that tool, which we use routinely for the last three, four years, there's much less pain and there's no bleeding because there's no scabs. So the bleeding comes from scabs falling off. If you don't have scabs, you don't have bleeding. Change the game on that. Um, so that's one reason why we're much more comfortable doing tonsillectomy. And then lastly, soon, probably next year, there'll be a tonsil dressing which you can put on the tonsil. I can't tell you by whom or where or why at the moment, but I can tell you there will be a tonsil dressing, which is a gel that you can put on the tonsil bed and it will act like an artificial barrier so that when the patient needs to eat, they can go eat without pain, they can go to school or work within 24 hours of the surgery. Total game changer after tonsillectomy. So that shifts the balance back into tonsillectomy again. But, but everything you said is very interesting and, and should be considered. Um, but the uh, real issue the, is the pain other, and the, the other issue that uh, a lot of people don't understand, I mean, which I don't know whether you all see very much in the US, is acid reflux. Now, a lot of the patients that, and then of course there's this huge thing about PPIs and overuse and stuff like that. But here, in, in, at least in my practice, I see a lot of patients with acid reflux. And there are even studies now that are relating acid reflux with OSA because of the, the, the pressure well, changes. It's always present in OSA because of the yeah. negative pressure they develop from the obstruction. Right. So That's if you treat different. all these things and you find that, you know, they actually improve a lot of the time. So, Prof. Kata, I know you're being ambiguous. So who do you support? Tomsilotomy or Tomsilotomy? 
He's been very diplomatic. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. In the interest of time, I have to conclude this. So it looks like um, a lot of you are still not convinced by the tonsillotomy job, yeah. method. Um, but thank you to uh, the speakers. Uh, thank you to the debaters. Um, and uh, thank you to Dr. Catalano for sharing uh, with us, you know, your experience and these new techniques. So again, you heard it first at the ENT Summit. Thank you. <laughs>